Oh boy! Welcome back, partner, to Behind the Bastards, the cowboy podcast. Yeah. Uh, talking about John Wayne, uh, who is about to get his first. He's just had his first role on screen, um, and he's about to get his first cowboy job. So he's 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 he he gets on a gig on a film uh, as a as a prop boy yet again with this dude Raul Walsh, this director, mm-hmm. and his. Apparently, the thing that gets him his first cowboy job is Walsh catches a glimpse of Marion while he's carrying furniture across a soundstage. He's again, he's huge and very strong. So he he has this like reputation of he'll just like pick up a couch when it needs to be moved and just like walk it as a, a, on his own like across the stage or something. And so Raul sees this big chode of a dude just kind of manhandling furniture. <laughs> Um, and he feels that like the Marion has a warm and wholesome expression on his face. Uh, quote, I stopped and watched. I noticed the fine physique of the boy, his careless strength and the grace of his movement. Um, hmm. Now, is this another Ford situation? No, are this seems ogling? to be genuine. He's are ogling we, for sure. But are we grooming? Hashtag Disney grooming. I mean, I think what you've got here is a dude whose job it is like any director this obviously gets problematic a lot of the time, but as a director, you should be able to like, you should be looking and appreciating the way people move and look. That is part of like your gig is to be like, Oh, I like the way that motherfucker moves. I just you know? appreciate the human form. Yeah. There's a creepy way for that. But in this case, it doesn't seem to be creepy. Although I should state John Wayne's opinion is that this is not the first time Walsh saw him and decided like he looked good. John Wayne's later opinion is that Walsh saw him at a Fox company picnic when he was super hungover and engaged in a walking contest, which he barely won because everybody was still pretty drunk. Um, whatever the case, Raul Walsh. Why did he always has to make these like backstories of like, no, actually like I beat him at arm wrestling. That's how we first met. Mm-hmm. I kicked his ass and then he gave me a part and I was like, this part sucks. It is one of those things. He's a liar, so I wouldn't be surprised about that. Although, I don't feel like barely won a walking contest while drunk is particularly cool either. That's true. (laughs) That's true. So who knows? Um, But his story is very much tall privilege. Yeah. He can't be a 6'3", brawny man hanging around a film set. Short King is not going to get noticed doing any of the same stuff. No. No. Sure. Um, he is, he is again, like being a tall white guy is the easy mode of life. It is, so, there, there's so many things you can, you can get out of just by being a tall white dude. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, so Marion, he, he, Walsh is like, I like the look of this kid. I want to make him a cowboy star. Uh, and he, he puts Marion through screen testing, which is like where they put you on camera to decide if you actually do look good on camera. And he does. Uh, so they cast him as the star of a, of an upcoming film, um, which more than doubles his pay overnight. Uh, nice. but it's clear, however, that th- his, he's going to need a new name. Marion Morrison, definitely not a cowboy actor name. Duke is no, that's better. a starlet name though. Like that's a, Oh yeah. Yeah. Summer. Yeah. Marion Morrison. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A great leading female name, but not, <laughs> not good for a cowboy actor in the twenties. Duke or the Morrison 30s still point. not cutting it. They decide not, uh, they decide he needs an even better name than Duke Morrison. Uh, And I'm going to quote from Scott Eyman here. Raul Walsh claimed that he came up with the name Wayne and that Sheehan, who's uh, another person involved in the film's production, added John. But Duke said that the whole thing was Sheehan's idea. Sheehan was a fan of Mad Anthony Wayne, the Revolutionary War General, because he had been tough and a nonconformist. The John seems to have been an afterthought, but it worked. Gave the two halves of the name the equivalence of two blocks of granite that miraculously fit together. And one of the things Wayne will later say that I think is true is that it kind of works as a single thing. You call him like John Wayne is a a single name on its own. Like it's not something you split up in your head. And that's part of why it's so it became so iconic. Um, So obviously they pick this name for him, which is, I think, objectively a good decision. You can't argue with the results. Um, It's certainly what about Wayne John? Wayne John's. No, you'd call him Wayne or John's, but you wouldn't call him Wayne John's. Yeah, Wayne. Wayne John fails. Wayne John can't lift a couch. Terrible name. Absolutely not. No, no. no. Wayne John is not a chode. John Wayne, hardcore chode. I love, 
I love your interpret like your definition of chode because it's very different than I think what my understanding of the word chode is, which is like a short. A short no, squat I, dick. I, <laughs> Me too. I have I have chosen I have taken it from the show. I think you should leave. So okay, got as it, got as it, got I it, do yes. every single thing I say. <laughs> well, look, um, I love that. Mm-hmm. So Fox, you know they they change this guy's name, um, and when they do their press releases and stuff for the movie he's going to be in, the big trail, they have to like come up with a backstory for him and they just lie all the time in these right like they don't give a shit what your actual backstory is fox is going to make up whatever it seems best so they decide to say that his birth name was wayne morrison uh which for whatever reason sounded better for them than the truth um Mm -hmm. and john's fine with this he doesn't fight back his museum states quote it was okay with him if the people paying his salary wanted to spruce up his name um which is reasonable as a poor kid if somebody's like hey we can make you rich and famous but you gotta pick a different fuck it I don't give a shit. Call yeah. me whatever. You can call me I Ice Tea. I don't my care. My mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So please take mm-hmm. that name away from. She took the only good name yeah. I had. She gave the good <laughs> name to my fucking brother. But that's crazy that you're not only inventing like a stage name, but you're like even your given name is not tough enough. You can't let people know you were ever called Marion. Yes. They're not going to buy that. Absolutely no. not. So uh, the big trail is not a good shoot. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's what you might call a problem. Um, I don't, I don't know. You know, you, you've, you've been on some sets, Francesca, um, uh, probably more than me, certainly more than me. I'm going to guess. Uh, so you tell me how normal this all sounds. I mean, I've ogled them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess I've been on like a set or two. What's up? Yeah. yeah. So the cast and crew had to travel out to Yuma, Arizona, uh, Mm. and Duke, now John Wayne, shows up on set drunk, and he stays that way for days. Um, He gets horrible diarrhea instantly. He gets sick from the water, and he can barely function. He's almost immediately like both so sick that he can't walk and still drinking. Um, So (laughs) this is his first star. This is his first starring role shows up hammered and then starts shitting himself. Amazing. Incredible. Unbelievable. Is that where he gets his actual cowboy walk? Not only the lean, but sort of the wide leg. Like I just shat my pants. (laughs) I don't want to smear this too much. Yeah. We've been there. I remember what it was like. Yeah. Um, So Iron Eyes Cody, the Italian man who pretended to be a Native American person, Mm. uh, takes care of John Wayne during this period when he's got deadly diarrhea. And Jensen, the biographer claims, quote, gave him various Indian remedies for diarrhea. Now, Again, Iron Eyes Cody, not an indigenous person. So God only knows. He's just spoon feeding him pasta. No, it was just limoncello. Just yeah. a little shot of limoncello. This it's, is a classic uh, um, food of the plains. Mm-hmm. Un po' di grappa. Grappa settles the stomach. <laughs> Every time. It's like, well, that's some ancient I don't understand your wisdom. ancient magic, but <laughs> thank you, Cody. <laughs> he just smacked him yeah he's literally uh, just cooking a pizza in an oven and everybody is like yeah. oh my god look at his, his he has not eaten his Cherokee in a week. wisdom yeah. <laughs> whiskey is not a meal <laughs> um so uh, after, in Cody's words, quote, puking and crapping blood for a week, oh my God. the director of the film, Walsh, is forced to shoot the movie around his star, who is actively dying at this point. Uh, he loses like 18 pounds in a couple of weeks. So, again, despite the fact that he is pooping himself to death, he does not quit drinking all day every day. Jensen writes that this was partly a factor of him wanting to show up all of the other drunk people on set. Quote, he had to show these self-important actors that he was as manly as they were. He drank like crazy, which prolonged his dysentery. <laughs> Nothing more manly than shitting your pants on a set. <laughs> that is that is what shows you're tough. Pooping That's- yourself to death because you drink so much. I mean, that's how Johnny Depp got into character for Pirates of the Caribbean. That is actually accurate. Yes. Um, <laughs> it is also how Johnny Depp got in the character for being Johnny Depp. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Every day. It's just rings 
and shitting his pants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's really all he needs. So Iron Eyes Cody recalled that one night the drinking got completely out of hand. Uh, the Apaches hired to work on the film got really wasted and decided to attack the settlers. Um, they raced into location, uh, set on their horses, drunkenly firing arrows into the wagons, the town set, and even the tents in which some of the cast and crew were sleeping. Oh, I and love this. And by the way, I have no idea if any of these guys were actually Apache or if they're just cast that way. It's probably a mix. Like a lot of them are probably like Cody, just like Italian dude. Like who knows? Um, it is Hollywood in the 20s. Um, so Cody wakes John Wayne up to warn him that like, hey, a bunch of the crew were shooting arrows at other people. Like it's kind of a big mess. <laughs> As a heads up, there's like an arrow fight going on on set. <laughs> um, and he sees that Duke is like too drunk to like know what's going on. So Cody sees these these actors on horses coming and he decides well, I might as well join them. So he gets on his horse and just starts shooting arrows at the set. And apparently Duke just keeps lying down and drinking the entire time. Um, so that's fun. It sounds like a fun filming set to do. Oh, the golden years of Hollywood. Like this guy can't even get up. No, he's not. No, like totally ha- useless. Half the set is like drunk and pretending to be indigenous and shooting arrows at the other half of the set. <laughs> Uh, and then the star is drunk and shitting his pants on on the floor. Uh, so it's just to move. grown up cowboys and Indians. Yeah, or like grown alcoholic. up seems like too strong a term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a bunch of seven year olds with access to liquor and real arrows. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the studio is not psyched with their big star. This is not a great first performance. You know, even in the 30s, you, you wanted a guy who, for example, could hold off on the being an alcoholic long enough to make the movie. Um, Wayne does eventually dry out enough to become functional. And it's because another actor sits down to drink with him. And instead of giving him normal whiskey, gives him what moonshine, basically pure ever clear. And oh. so John Wayne drinks like essentially 180 proof ever clear with a stomach bug, which makes him so sick that he stops drinking for a while. <laughs> God. Is there anything alcohol can't do? You just have to jangle keys in front of his face, but like, yeah, like worse alcohol for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the big trail flops. Not a gr- It doesn't do super well as a movie, although people today will claim it was a really good movie. It just isn't like a huge hit at the time. It kind of is is not seen as very successful, but it's people will argue it's a, it's a pretty good movie. Um, Those people are fucking lying. Like, I don't know. Are- it seems uh, maybe it was good. Like, who knows? Like, I would watch the behind the scenes once again. Sure. Whatever I would film. much. Pre- yeah. Like a uh, like the documentary about the making of the Isle of Dr. Moreau. Like haven't seen it, but believe oh, you. Oh, it's it's inc- the the director, initial director of the film was a wizard who went crazy and got fired and decided to live in the jungle and sneak onto set in costume every day while they were trying to make the movie. Oh, that's <laughs> it's fucking it's, amazing. It's fucking awesome. It's such a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Okay. Um, um can I just butt in and say that Iron Eyes Cody's real name yeah. was Espera Oscar de Corti. <laughs> yes. Which also like a really effeminate name, Espera. Espera, is, like, that really is a fun effemin- name. Yeah, so no wonder he and Marion got along. Uh-huh. Um, no, it's just, it's very funny. I do like the image of him like feeding lasagna to John Wayne and pretending it's like an ancient Apache remedy for <laughs> diarrhea. Yeah. I can't figure out what he's doing. <laughs> and all of the other Italians in costume are like, yeah, no, that's an ancient remedy. <laughs> oh, Hollywood was... Pretty racist. <laughs> um, still is. So the big trail, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't kill his career entirely because a lot of people do see it as a pretty decent movie. Um, but it doesn't it does like poorly enough that he spends most of the next decade kind of just hanging in there as an actor. He's 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 moved up s- solidly from prop boy, but he's also kind of a side character. He's like Ronald Reagan, right? He's not unknown, but nobody in this period really considers themselves a John Wayne fan. You know, mm-hmm. like they've got a career, they're doing OK, but they're also not like they're never like top build usually. Right. They're not the, they're not going to move a lot of butts into seats. Right. Um, and Western's are pretty much 
all this out there, correct? There's a lot. No, there's a lot of gangster movies. There's a lot of romance flicks. There's some like war pictures and stuff. Like, but westerns are they're like the Marvel movies of the day, broadly speaking, yes. right? Like, they're the most number one. What tends to get like not like they're kind of the most consistent way people are making a bunch of money. They're like superhero right. films, bro- right, right, right. broader than Marvel. Because there's cheap ones too, because you can make them pretty cheap sometimes. And Right, this is the Fast and the Furious <laughs> franchise. Yeah, there, the there's elements of that. identity, I don't know. Right. Like it, 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 Mission these Impossible. Are, these are a lot of your action films, right? This is what puts butts in seats. These are the popcorn flicks, right? And yeah. John Wayne, kind of for a decade, is sort of a side character in those sort of movies, right? He's rarely going to be a particularly big kid because he's not a big draw, you know? This changes in 1939 when John gets finally cast in a John Ford cowboy film called Stagecoach. If you have ever, whenever you are watching like a movie or a TV show that mentions John Wayne or cowboy movies, you will see the same clip from the movie Stagecoach. And it is John Wayne with a lever action gun that he flips over and over in his hand as he fires while walking onto screen and it like slowly zooms on in his face. It is one of the most iconic scenes in Western cinema. Um, Among other things, it's entirely why Terminator 2 the action scenes initially are shot the way it's why uh, Arnold in that movie gets a lever action shotgun that he can flip around and fire. (laughs) It's this really iconic moment that makes its way into a bunch of modern pop culture. Right. Um, And that is the moment, that moment when John Wayne walks on scene in stagecoach that makes him as a a star. And I'm going to quote from a Buzzfeed write up by uh, Anna Helen Peterson. Stagecoach was intended as an ensemble picture. Wayne doesn't even show up until 15 minutes into the film. But when he does, it's with a hero's intro. Wayne twirls his rifle as if it were a pistol as the camera zooms into a glorious close-up of Wayne's face. It's become one of the most iconic scenes in classic cinema, and Wayne's way out of quickie western purgatory. Gradually, Wayne became something of a leading man. He was in Ford's next picture, The Long Voyage Home, as a Swedish fisherman, and played a Navy officer opposite Marlene Dietrich in Seven Sinners. Wayne Wayne's westernness was treated as a matter of fact. He was, in photo plays words, the typical Western American, open-faced and open-minded. But the press also emphasized that he enjoyed the finer things. Wayne, dressed with meticulous care, like any well-caffed businessman, looks f- divine in tucks or tails, and doesn't wing a guitar or sing sad pieces about Western skies, either. He lived in an exquisitely furnished home in the swankiest section of Hollywood and has no yin for horses off-screen. So he becomes huge after this, right? Stagecoach makes him into a leading man and he kind of immediately takes off in Hollywood. Part of it is that he's been in film 20 years at this point. He's in his, he's like 40. Um, He's old enough to get, he's one of these guys who doesn't look right until he gets kind of grizzled. Uh-huh. Um, and so he gets very popular for that. And he doesn't just get ca- cast as the stead in Westerns. Um, And he's kind of the first cowboy actor who's more actor than cowboy. Because the, the, the previous generation, guys like John Mix, are real cowboys, you know? Right. Like, that's how they yeah, learned M- the shit Mix that they did. Mix is the real deal. Yeah. Wayne isn't really. Like, he's he's got some of that in his background, right? Like, he has some claim to it. But it's, he's kind of a, you know, he, he's a fancy dandy boy. You know, he wants to, he's, he's just <laughs> he's having a good time being a rich guy. Yeah. And, and he grew up poor. So it's like, yeah, he's going to yeah. want to not ride a horse to and yeah. from set. Right, right. It's often framed as like he hated horses and it's like, no, he just had to do that as a kid. He probably doesn't want to do it anymore. Like he's right. ridden too many horses. But that's really interesting that like it takes, especially in the Westerns and maybe in this time that like having an older hero was much more compelling than like, you know, you know, the Tom Hollands of today, like a little baby face Spider-Man. Yeah. You're like, no, we yeah, want a did- grizzled guy who's killed many, many, many people. You want a guy who's like looks like he's kind of seen some shit who can who can play that off a little bit. And he doesn't even this isn't really the height of his career because he's still kind of young at this point. Right. Um, But yeah, this is the first time he gets his big break. He's old enough to 
you know, to look like he's been through some stuff. Yeah. Um, now, there's one last postscript to the story of Stagecoach. While it ignited John Wayne's career, by 1939, Tom Fix was largely out of work and desperate for a good job. He asked John Ford for a part on Stagecoach, and Mix would allege until his death that John Wayne begged Ford not to give Mix the part. <laughs> Sabotaged the guy who got him his first job. Right? Real piece of shit, you know? You son of a bitch. What? I know. You're like, oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah, because it was supposed to be an ensemble cast or it yeah. is an ensemble cast. There's and room kno- for everybody. Yeah, but you know, if if Mix is in there, maybe that's going to take some shine away from John Wayne. He's not going to, because Mix is a better cowboy actor, uh, maybe that's going to fuck with uh, John Wayne's ability to, uh, you know, shine on set. Right. Now, does he learn anything in these, in these years? Like, is he a better alcoholic number one he's an incredible alcoholic okay good. you got to give him credit for that the king like really honestly this is a separate story but when i do my (laughs) podcast on the heroes of drunk driving he's one of the most influential (laughs) drunk drivers there ever really invented a lot of modern drunk driving techniques um holding a beer in between his legs uh screaming at his wife drunkenly from in the back seat while he drives like all of those mm-hmm. John Wayne mm-hmm. originals peeing Real. in the closet when you think oh, it's the bathroom the, nobody could piss in a closet like John Wayne absolutely not hell yeah <laughs> oscar uh, you know what else is oscar worthy these ads <laughs> And we're back. Uh, and the Oscar for best ad goes to the one about how mattresses no longer uh, uses rare earth minerals mined by slave labor in the Congo to make their beds. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was back in the 1700s. That was back in the 1700s when mattress was uh, better known as the East India Trading Company. <laughs> Um, they've moved on. Now they just ship people mattresses. It's fine. <laughs> We've forgiven them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you need to forgive them too. That's the message of our Oscar winning mattress ad. So in the Ford film Seven Sinners, John Wayne played opposite Marlena Dietrich. Uh, and she's the real actress who inspired the fictional v- Bridget von Hammersmark in Inglorious Bastards. Mm. So in that movie, she is the German actress that Quentin Tarantino insisted on strangling on camera for very unclear reasons. Um, or maybe not so unclear reasons. I don't, I, <laughs> I'm not enough of an expert on that, but it's weird, right? We can all agree it's weird. It's kind of uncomfortable that he did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm remembering that. That's in the... Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. It's like the, it, yeah, it's, it, he wanted it to be his hands on, on camera that strangled her. Very weird. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, but, not up. Mm-hmm. but not before see you see her feet. God, I see her feet. Then I strangle her. Fucking Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Such a weirdo. <laughs> so, um, She's the real actress that that lady's based off of. She's uh, quite a star, one of the most famous leading ladies ever, and certainly in this period, um, kind of top of the fucking female, you know, actor food chain. Um, now, in real life, Wayne and Dietrich started hooking up immediately. Sure. Um, she is way more experienced than him. Um, she, Sexually? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She is Marlene Dietrich, and he is this an awkward a uh, boy who spends most of his time drunk with a bunch of dudes on a yacht. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that like he, obviously he gets super into this thing. He's also kind of insecure with her and around her because she's more experienced than him and more famous than him. Um, so a few things are going on here. This is kind of a complex relationship. Although I think for Marlene, she just likes fucking hot actors, you know, yep. he's, he's the one who starts developing some complexes around this. Hey boy, mm-hmm. boy. Lift that couch over there. That's yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Hang on. Let me pour some oil on your back. That's right. Keep doing that. No, nope, no. Nope. I didn't say come yet. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously he's still married 
to Josie at this point, his his wife. Of course. Um, Good old Josie. When they get married, when he and his wife get married, like their friends from the beginning are like, well, this isn't going to last. Uh, he is incapable of not cheating on you constantly, and you are super Catholic. Now, heartbreakingly, Josie adores her husband. Um, John mostly seems to be distracted and frustrated by her. She feels like his acting, like her attitude is, I just got to put up with this for a little while. Nobody is in acting very long. Eventually, it'll he'll, he'll get too old. It'll be a short fling for him. Um, and then he'll figure out something more serious to do with his life. Um, John Wayne kind of views his wife and children the same way. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this ain't uh, even my whole thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um so he would later complain to friends that he and Josie only had sex four times during their marriage. Yo, what um, the fuck? Probably a lie, but like a gross one. Yeah. So mean. Yeah, so what cruel. the fuck, dude? Um, he's just so angry that... Like, what does that say about you, too? Well, like, that's it, obviously doesn't look good on you, bro. Look, man, maybe she would want to fuck you more if she didn't feel like you were fucking every single other person in town because she's not into that shit. Like, maybe <laughs> maybe your behavior is having an impact on the things you don't like about your marriage, John Wayne. No, I'm that's like, not, no he's not going to have that I'm not really thought. into my wife. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, those kids? Uh-huh. <laughs> four nuts. Honestly, that was it. That was yeah. it. In and out. Five it, pumps, four nuts. I mean, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. She's like Five not pumps. even that hot. Like my wife's like not as hot as Marlena. <laughs> wow, you are just quoting directly from his autobiography. <laughs> the story of a chode, <laughs> the tale of John Wayne. <laughs> Uh, so he's God. initially some people will say was kind of morally conflicted about all the sleeping around he was doing but by the time he's an actual star it becomes just like totally uh, he, he it becomes just like so routine to him that he stops trying to hide it so Everyone in Hollywood knows that John Wayne and Marlene Dietrich are sleeping with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, They do not even like they they're out in public together at events while Josie is eight months pregnant, which doesn't do. She's not happy. You know, that's not great. That's not a great position to put someone in. Um, So she confronts him over it, but she's also too Catholic to divorce him. Right. Like you don't (sighs) do that. So she's. Yeah, it's it's grody. Um, like his do, parents got divorced. Yeah, like his parents, and, and he. It's interesting. Twenty years earlier, or whatever. That he doesn't push for divorce because um, he could have. And Jensen, one of his biographers, suspects that this is because he's still too possessive and insecure about her. Um, right. And I'm going to he, read. He's it. actually the piece of shit in the relationship. Oh, for sure, absolutely, right. he's the piece of shit in this relationship. <laughs> I don't know much about Josie, but I know that John Wayne is the bad guy in this relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to read a quote about him as a as a husband and a father from uh, from Jensen's book. He demanded his children profess their love to him on a daily basis. Barely able to sleep, Duke awoke every day before dawn and demanded the entire house rise with him, even if it was a day off. For family and friends, he had a litany of rules based upon superstitions, which were a result of a childhood of poverty and emotional abuse by his mother. Ever convinced that he was destined for ruin, Duke insisted that these superstitions be followed or his life would collapse into abject failure. So he... He, d- he makes bizarre rules for his family. He screams at them if they put hats on beds. Can't do that around John. If you, uh, if you spill salt, you have to toss it over your shoulder, which is n- not an uncommon thing in this day. Uh, umbrellas can only be opened outside. No one can hand him a salt shaker. You don't <laughs> hand John Wayne a salt shaker. <laughs> you know what's really uh, funny about that is that I like I lived in Latin America for a while and same thing like I mean just a superstition you put the salt on the table then you can pick it up yeah there's like a lot like this is not he didn't invent this it's not like only to him maybe the no hats on beds thing I haven't heard that hats before on, that's kind of weird he, but is he like you know, like, you know g- look me in the eyes when we toast otherwise seven years bad luck of you know seven that one's years, true that one's true yeah or like seven years of bad sex toast. or whatever it is mm-hmm. yeah. even though I've only done it with your mom four times four I times yes, he, he says at the sex. dinner table after <laughs> screaming about salt <laughs> yeah uh, but like, what does it mean profess your love like just every day. Yeah, you got to tell dad that he's a good dad before he goes out to fuck Marlene Dietrich. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on Rodeo Drive out in public. Um, but he doesn't start it. Like it can't be him to say I love you first. That is unclear. But I he does not strike me as a say I love you first kind of dude. I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe. 
So uh, he's also like this around his friends. Uh, he's got these card playing buddies that he plays cards with. And if somebody sets a card on the table face up by accident, they have to get up and circle their chair three times in order to avoid bad luck. Um, so he's, you know, again, this is not, I think people might be want to say this is like OCD. I don't know. Maybe I'm not going to diagnose him, but these are all like superstitions that exist at the time. And he's just, this is not an uncommon thing with people who like grow up in desperate situations where they get super paranoid about not wanting to do anything that could make shit go wrong for them. Cause they understand how fragile success is right. um, and how shitty it is when you're dirt poor. I get it, you know, not that it's good, but I understand what's going on in his head here, I think. So while he's keeping a tight eye on his wife and kids, he escalates his relationship with Dietrich. Uh, She later claimed that she more or less directed their affair as the more experienced partner. Quote, what pleased me most was he wasn't vain or arrogant. Far from it. He was insecure as an actor, worried about his talent or what he felt was a lack of it. As a man, he was a little insecure and vulnerable. I was able to help in both respects. We had a small affair, a small friendship, which we both enjoyed. Now that's to her again, Marlene Dietrich, huge star. Yeah. Uh, He, it's a bigger thing for him and it's definitely a bigger thing for his wife for whom this is devastating. Right. Marlene's just like, yeah, you know, is this, he was, he was young. He needed somebody to show him the ropes and like make him feel better about himself. I did that. It's whatever. And then I went on and fun. Yeah. I liked that he was insecure. Yeah. I enjoyed that he didn't know how to talk back to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, his poor um, little wife. How cute. Mm, yes, Eight was, months pregnant. She's mm, fat. Four children. Yes. <laughs> Just like, yeah. No, but that's really interesting that, I mean, it might, um, I'm curious to how this ends because I feel like it's foreboding. Like she clearly, he was clearly obsessed with oh, her. Oh, there's some how, boating how going on. Well, That's an interesting part here. So John Wayne was actually in Mexico partying with Dietrich while his wife, Josie, delivers their fourth child and second daughter, Melinda. Um, So their relationship continued for some time. And while Wayne definitely got along better with Dietrich than he did with his wife, it was also a tempestuous relationship. And I'm going to read a real rough quote from the true life of John Wayne here. Duke handled her the way he handled every woman in his life. When she provoked him, he punched her, and it didn't matter if it was in public. On location for the spoilers in Lake Arrowhead, California, Duke and Marlene were rehearsing a scene for the film. Duke suggested one way to play the scene, and Marlene suggested another. Duke pressed his point, and Marlene finally shot back, That's a dumb idea. Duke's face turned to stone, and his eyes burned with suppressed rage. As the camera was about to roll, Duke angrily retied his bandana, which he'd loosened between takes. Uh, Duke tied a bigger than normal knot, and Marlene saw it and told him, you don't even know how to tie a bandana. Suddenly, Duke exploded. He swung a huge fist in a roundhouse right and hit Marlene right in the face. She went flying, landing hard in the rough dirt. Marlene lay sprawled on the ground for a moment, gathering her senses. She didn't cry. Now... No, no, she was on the ground and straight up when she came to, she lit a cigarette. That's well, it's actually it, more uncomfortable than that, <laughs> Francesca, because according to Jensen, whose source here is the actress Margaret Lindsay, who is there on set when this happens, she looks up at him with intense arousal, gets up and gives him what is described by this other actress as a love punch, and then they start making out. So, oh my God. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you want to do with this information. How you want to parse that all out? But that's what someone else who was there says went down. I've been um, waiting for you to do that since the moment I met you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he he will he will be repeatedly physically abusive to people uh, to women specifically throughout his life. It is unclear to me if that's what's going on here or if they just had kind of a thing. Where that I I don't I really don't know like I don't know what's going on with these two. Um, I knows? mean, it's interesting though because she as even though she did that, you got to think about being a star like For her sure. in that time. You're on set. This guy who you're sleeping with, who's younger, more inexperienced, mm-hmm. hits you. What are you gonna do? Like cry or be mad or whatever? <laughs> that shows so much vulnerability. Yeah, you're gonna get up and be like, "No, I liked it. It's exactly. great. Whatever. You know, yeah. like that yeah. is much more a position of strength when you've got to protect your image. That's right. Right, and that's a huge, probably part of what's like. I, I mean, I don't know these people, obviously. Sure. <laughs> um, but that seems really plausible to me. 
Um, yeah, and, how uh, fucking uh, embarrassing otherwise. Yeah. And again, a number of people through the years in other circumstances see John Wayne hit women in public, like with his fists. Not that like a slap is okay either, but like specifically like punching them. Um, it's just like a thing John Wayne does. Uh, like his like his like his mentor John Ford. Um, oh yeah, co- cool dudes. Learned it from the best. So yeah, uh, it is also yeah. So Duke's relationship with Marlene fell apart for the same reason so many of his relationships did. He started fucking a teenage girl in Mexico. Um, yeah, so that's why this doesn't work out. She may have been working as a prostitute at the time. Her exact background is kind of unclear. Some sources will say her mother ran a brothel that was very popular with the actors, and that's where John Wayne meets her. Um, But we know that he definitely, at age 34, I think, starts fucking at at the oldest. She's like 17 at this point. Um, Her name is Esperanza Bauer. Uh, She goes by Chata. Um, Biographer Randy Roberts writes in his book, John Wayne, American, quote, Chata's life before 1941 is a mystery. She was never accepted in Hollywood, and rumors circulated at the time that she met John Wayne that she was working as a high-priced call girl and a bit actress in the Mexican film industry. Pilar Wayne later wrote that Chata was born in the slums of Mexico City and became a prostitute to escape poverty. Others said that when Chata and Duke met, she was married to a Mexican student named Eugenio Morrison. We really don't know what her background is, but we know she is uh, a teenager and possibly a sex worker. Uh, hard to say. Um, Roberts. Chata. Chata. Yeah. And e- maybe even the worst, which is not a sex worker, but the daughter of someone yeah, who a owned trafficking a brothel, victim, was you know, not actually working and then was it's hard, yeah. preyed upon. We really do not know the precise details here. Other than that, it's for sure gross, right? It's for sure gross. It's for sure bad stuff. Um, it's just the exact dimensions of like what precisely was going on is kind of unclear, but it's for sure bad. And I should note here that like Roberts's book is way classier in its description of Chada than Jensen's book. Um, sure, isn't it? It's should, called what? American. John um, Wayne American. Well, gee, I mean, because Jensen is like the most negative book about John Wayne, but it's also written by a dude who was writing at least in a pretty gross time and I think was kind of gross himself because he describes Chata as, quote, an underaged prostitute with a smoking body and amazing good looks. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> like, holy shit, Jensen, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> and that's her biography. If you are describing someone as an underaged prostitute... The whatever comes next should never include the phrase smoking, <laughs> smoking. body. Never. You have just stated you're talking about a child, Richard Jensen. God. What a Again, John Wayne biographer is probably only moderately less terrible than John Wayne. No, exactly. He's <laughs> yeah. only a few gradations better um, on the Me Too creep predator scale. And again, I, I also I am unclear as to how much we should like. There's a, a, a lot of people who are argue if someone's underage, you should always say sex trafficking victim rather than uh, prostitute. But also, this is a real different time and i don't know the extent to which she has agency in her life and 17 is means a different thing in 1939 than it does today in some ways like i have no idea what's going on i have no idea whether she's a victim of her mom or if she is pursuing a rich guy to get out of like mexico and into the united states right. and like like who know, i don't know what's I happening i mean here. from brothel to hollywood like yeah. i'll take the deal because she's also trying to get a career in Hollywood, which John Wayne attempts to help her with. So, like, there's there's stuff going on here. It's certainly horrific behavior on John Wayne's part. But was um, there love? You know what I mean? John like, Wayne falls in love, he says. Um, he will, for years, call her his true love, uh, even after they have split up. And um, he punched, punches her. Oh, it's he punches punch. her a lot. He punches her a lot. Um, so... Whatever is going on in her background, Wayne falls in love immediately. He moves her to California where he has her tell people she's 24 years old. Um, so he <laughs> knows this is gro- Again, we just said like these are somewhat different times and some of this stuff is viewed differently. But John Wayne knows this is gross enough that he has to age her up. Uh-huh. You know, like so again, <laughs> even not for that Hollywood. different. Yeah. Even for Hollywood, people are like. That's kind of young, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, he starts trying. One of the things that's important to him, 
And again, we don't know how much it is that she wanted a career in movies. There's an argument to be made that he wanted her to be seen as having a career. So Mm. it doesn't look like he just trafficked a girl from Mexico into Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So whatever's going on here, again, super messy. Uh, super messed up. Um, Marlena Dietrich, when she finds out that what he's doing, that he's that he's set this girl up with an apartment in Hollywood and brought her into the country, she dumps him. She's like, uh, no, no, no. Like, that's that's fucking weird, John. <laughs> like, yeah. So um, I don't know. Good for Marlene, I guess. Yeah, uh, she'll, she's fine. He's still married to Josie at this point, though. And oh, if she wasn't Josie. happy with Back Marlene Dietrich, she's really not happy with, with this. Um, not psyched about what, what John is doing. Um, now, her parents are both high society Catholics. And so he's called upon regularly to show up at a Vincent functions. Um, and, you know, he's surly because he'd rather be fucking someone who is at the oldest now, 19, right? They've been together a couple of points. <laughs> so he just acts like he's a just- dick. At all cruise. these parties. He, he goes he, to the events to cruise for like young Catholic girls. He goes to the events so that everyone knows how much he doesn't want to be there. Like he sulks because he'd rather be with his like teenage mistress in the, the apartment that he makes the studio pay for her in Hollywood. Um, one of the family friends was like. And they did. And they did. <laughs> um, yeah. So he's like, not only is he cheating on his wife with a teenager, but he has to like make sure everybody knows how unfair he thinks it is that he has to show up at parties where adults are. Um, cool guy, John Wayne. Um, what a dude. So, and at Chata, this point, Hollywood is helping bankroll sort of the oh yeah because he's too big of a cash cow for them mm-hmm. to like tell he's him making them a lot of money. Yeah, this is the early forties. He he moves Chad to Hollywood in the spring of forty three. Some will argue that it was like. Part of what he was doing by having the studio pay for her apartment and pay for her to like they, they would give her like money every month that it was partly like a tax dodge. Like that's how he received some of his salary so that it wasn't taxed. I don't know how to evaluate uh, the truth of that, but it sure. does sound like some movie star shit. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. not <laughs> only are so. you like keeping a secret teenage mistress, but you're doing it as a tax dodge, uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. like and everyone's on board. Yeah, that's that does sound very Hollywood and yes. in, in, in the nows too. like that's not just a 40s thing. Um so the two start seeing each other probably in 41. I think like 43 is when she moves to Hollywood. That's also the year, 1941, that the United States, helped along by our buddies in Japan, decides to give this whole World War II thing a try, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is our big old patriotic war, right? Every, everybody's got to go volunteer to fight. It is all but unthinkable for young leading men in the prime of their life, action movie stars, right? You've got this war where absolutely every man who can is doing something, it's considered obscene by a lot of people that somebody capable of doing action in, like in the film, somebody like being a, a war hero in movies, uh-huh. wouldn't go volunteer to fight, to serve in some way, sure. right? Sure. Jimmy Stewart tries to join the army. He gets rejected as being under... He has just won, like I think, an Academy Award. This is right after It's a Wonderful Life. He, he's one of the biggest stars in the world. He gets rejected for being underweight. So he <laughs> hires a personal trainer so he can bulk up. And he joins the Army Air Corps and he, he flies 20 bomber missions over Europe. Like Holy the, the shit. most One of the most dangerous jobs of the entire war, Jimmy Stewart. He retires as a general. How the like, fuck did I know? Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy, know Jimmy Stewart bombs like Europe repeatedly. <laughs> like okay. he, is, he has an incredibly dangerous job. They didn't need all um, of those bombs. Some of them, no, yes. But um. <laughs> yeah, but it's also like undeniably as one of the biggest stars in the world, he takes a job where like a huge percentage of men who do that job die doing it. Yeah. Like it is incredibly dangerous. Um, And there's a lot of famous actors who do similar things. Clark Gable, who was over 40 at the point and was old enough that he could have gotten out of serving, joins the Air Force. Some will say he was suicidal because his wife had just died. But he flew. He also flies bomber missions as an aerial gunner. Clark right, Gable this- is like crammed into a gun in the belly of a bomber like shooting at fighter planes and so shit. even though it's not like all these movie stars you know were once action heroes or the detectives yeah. or they anyone they were in real life <laughs> yeah. they become them because it's sort of still seen as you know yeah. you know serving your country so and you're a role like, model even though like some a lot of these guys go on to be politically problematic but they're all of course. human enough to look at the Nazis and be like well, I should, we should probably do something about that huh? right. <laughs> we probably gotta do something about that <laughs> right 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 or just mm. even 
even like the idea that you would attempt to physically train to be able mm-hmm. to like like Jimmy could have just like you know tried to put on the weight like I just yeah. can't do it you know yeah, he's got to get big enough <laughs> yeah well, I just oh, can't yeah but he committed uh, mm-hmm. oh my god that yeah all right uh, and so and so Henry Fonda. Uh, who could have gotten out of the service because he had three kids and initially they weren't drafting f- like fathers, right? They were trying to keep families together. They were mainly drafting single men. Fonda could have gotten a deferment. Instead, he enlists in the Army Air Corps and again, like serves his country at war. Now, a lot of big stars did f- not join the military. Gary Cooper doesn't join Bing Crosby, James Cagney, but they're also way over 40, I think at this point, like they're old enough that like, well, I just can't, you know, I'm an old man. I'm just going to slow everybody down. Right. Which fair enough. You probably shouldn't be getting into that stuff. If you're Bing Crosby and you have been chain smoking cigarettes since age eight, (laughs) you might not be helpful. Um, But John Wayne was young enough to serve. He's in his mid-30s at this point, right? He is the prime of his life. He is a big, strong man. Initially, though, he qualifies for a deferment, and he gets a deferment because he has a wife and kids, right? Uh, I got six kids, you know? Good old Josie. I'm going to keep saying good old Josie. Good old Josie. I got to stay with Josie and the kids, you know? I got to keep them. I got to keep them. You know, I got to. I I want to go out there and fight the Krauts. Don't get me wrong, but ah, this family, I'm so dedicated to my family. I've got a wife to sleep around. John. Yeah, yeah, I've got a wife to sleep around on. <laughs> I have kids to ignore. <laughs> um, so he gets a deferment, um, and his studio uses his family as an excuse for the fact that he's not serving with. Because the press ask, right? Of John course. Wayne's a big star. He's not. What? What are you doing in the war, John Wayne? That everyone else is a part of. Um, this excerpt from an article in Modern Screen is a good example of how they justified this. "Quote: A man of thirty-five heading to a family of six has to think twice." before leaving. Just the same, Big John Wayne is restless because, like I said, he's a man's man who thinks straight and believes in action. It's a dilemma for a family man and an American gentleman who wants to make a personal appearance in the big scrap. So that's how they frame it as like, oh, he really wants to get in there, but ah, he's just got it. He's got his family. Oh, he'd love to make a cameo, <laughs> yeah, but he just oh, he's he can't he's get fucking away. a teenager that he traffics into the United States. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure if you've heard of the Alcoholics Yacht Club. Mm -hmm. Very important Mm -hmm. work that they're doing Mm -hmm. out there in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, the most important branch of the Navy is the Alcoholic Yacht Club. Yeah, yeah. Um, So he would love to. Oh, my God. mm -hmm. He'd so love to be there to help your little war effort. Uh, Yeah. Now, it's very funny, too, because while he's making these claims in 42 and 43, he has already moved Chata into Hollywood and asked his wife for a divorce. They are separated when when he's claiming all of this shit to the press. (laughs) Now, Uh, hang on. Not yet. Not yet, honey. Don't sign the papers. (laughs) Don't. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, And now. (laughs) Although, actually, I should say he really does want it. Um, She refuses to divorce him for a while because, you know, again, she's incredibly Catholic. Uh, And his mentor, patron John Ford, gives Mm -hmm. him hell, too, for trying to divorce her because he's Catholic. Right. Ford, who, again, beats his wife relentlessly, believes that John Wayne should stay married because that's what God wants and just keep cheating on his wife oh yeah you know? i mean like, hit, that's the john ford women, way but also trap them that's you don't what leave the them john come on yeah, <laughs> yeah. God, so that's a, what a fucking like so good on clyde and molly i just want to say that you know early pioneers it. a lot it. of things trying yeah. to farm in the desert mm-hmm. uh, but also getting a divorce and mm-hmm. one of those two things was successful being abusive really r- very revolutionary that molly was the one doing the abusing to a plus like incredible work Um, so it is worth emphasizing that John Wayne, while he dodged the draft in World War II, justified it by needing to take care of his family. While he's doing this, he is living away from his wife in luxury at the Chateau Marmont and fucking a girl who is at most 19, who he possibly illegally trafficked into the United States. That part's questionable, but, um, yeah, incredible stuff. (laughs) He's a cool dude. (laughs) <laughs> but good like guy. so on brand for very, the kind very of hollow brand. Christian mm-hmm. masculinity, like, you know, emblem that he is. Mm-hmm. He doesn't actually and, and kind of the shift of like, oh, no, 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 that's the old way is to actually put your money where your mouth is or do yeah. something like be a hero. This is like it's now all you just Hollywood. Pretend. Yeah. Like, yeah, I just Matt imagine, Gates like, is, is playing from this playbook, you know? Exactly. Like, I'm just, yeah. like, thinking, like, what if, like, Jenna Bush was sent to Iraq? 
lol. Like Jenna Bush. I mean, is co-hosting Good Morning America. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I I think we should send all of the children of yes. uh, elected leaders into war zones. I don't care which ones. They don't need to be supported or have weapons. Just send them. Just mail them there. You know what? Like yeah. in a shipping crate. It's the Today of, Show, but yes, they sh- yeah. and they should all be sent there. I mean, mm-hmm. retroactively, you could still go to Iraq. I like help rebuild, bro. Well, I don't think I don't look. I, <laughs> I don't think the Iraqis need Jenna Bush's help. Um, <laughs> Why but, not? You know, um, she could take somebody's place in a city getting shelled right now. Um, just That's move true. them into your house, Jenna. Come on, that is indeed, d- do something. So Ford chastises uh, John Wayne for quote. This is how he talks about John Wayne's teenage, uh, 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 I don't know what term to use here, but he, he says that Child he's play, playing with Mexican jumping beans. Cause again, everyone's <laughs> very racist. Very like these are like, this is for 1943, you know, <laughs> like, um, but he also calls him a damn fool for breaking up his marriage. According to biographer Roberts, Wayne wrote back that the marriage is over and he quote, does not give a four letter word. If I could see my kids, I don't give a shit. If she takes the kids. Awesome. What a hero. So there are several things John Ford never uh, forgave John Wayne for. And this is one of them. When the war started, Ford, to his credit, well, I don't know if this is to his credit, but Ford joins the OSS, which is the precursor to the CIA. And he gets the rank of commander and he gets this to make like propaganda movies, right? That's what Reagan does during the war, Mm -hmm. right? A lot of guys who don't want to go fight because not everybody does the Jimmy Stewart thing still join the military and they make propaganda reels about how not to get VD or whatever. Um, <laughs> John. So that's John there Ford's was some job. Good stuff in those days. It was, there was it, some good stuff. Some good VD. You mean? Yeah. Oh. Oh real my good God. VD. The old time syphilis. This new shit cannot compete. No. The itch mm-hmm. isn't the same. The mm-hmm. S- mm-hmm. Nothing. Just yeah. No. The burning you kids. pee. It just yeah. doesn't hold a candle. You kids don't even know what it's like to have your pee burn. <laughs> Unbelievable. Zoomers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Um, biographer Scott Iman basically says, so uh, again, Ford joins the OSS and starts calling John Wayne a coward for failing to serve, um, and tries to push him to join. Now there's a couple of different versions of what Wayne wants to do in the OSS. Biographer Scott Iman frames it as if John Wayne wanted to get like a special ops gig suited for a, an action star. Yeah. So in Iman's telling, he crafts his application to the OSS to make him look like an international man of mystery. Quote, Swimming, above average, small boat sailing, average, football, played college ball at the University of Southern California, squash and tennis, fair, deep sea fishing, seven marlin in two years, hunting, good field shot, horseback riding, have done falls and posse riding in pictures, not as easy as it sounds. So that's that's the way, like, I'm in is like, he wants to try to get a job doing, like, you know, secret agent kind of shit. Um, squash and tennis? <laughs> That's fair. Okay. Look, it's basically throwing a grenade, you know, fair. (laughs) Yeah. So Ford introduces John Wayne to wild Bill Donovan, who's the head of the OSS and like will become the founder of the CIA. Um, And Donovan suggests that Wayne might be good for what they call small boat work, which is running the German blockade to deliver weapons to partisans, which would be a pretty cool thing to do in World War Two. Okay. he really wants to get him a bit role in the war. In the war. Well, and it, like, if he'd done this, that's dope. Like, that's literally um, fucking, uh, 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 what's his name's character in Casablanca? Um, oh, God. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Bogart Bogart's yes, character that's gonna... what he's doing he's like running guns to to rebels in like occupied Europe and shit so Iman says like that's what John Wayne is trying to do Wild Bill's like oh yeah you'd be perfect for this John Wayne's like I would love to run guns past the Nazi blockade I just got to finish three more movies like give me three more movies but then I'm gonna I'm gonna be ready to get in you know I'm ready to get in and friends of his at the time will note that he kind of always tells people, I just got to do one more movie. I got to do two more movies and then I'm getting into the war effort. Don't worry, guys. I'm, I'm almost there. I'll be right um, behind you. This is like Trump on January 6th. Just like you guys go. So I'll be right there. 
There are versions of this story. One version is that he films his three pictures and he calls this officer at the OSS that Donovan had set him up with. And that guy was like, dude, we sent you a letter. You know, did you not get it? We already filled that position. So John gets worried. because He's like, oh, no, I'm going to miss my chance to be in the OSS. And he sends John Ford a letter which states. Dear Pappy, have you any suggestions on how I should get in? Can I get assigned to your outfit? And if I could, would you want me? How about the Marines? You have Army and Navy men under you. Have you any Marines? Or how about a CB? Or what would you suggest? I just hate to ask favors, but for Christ's sake, you can suggest, can't you? Now, Iman's take here seems to be that John Wayne was perhaps unwilling to fight, but or willing to serve, but not as like a simple soldier. Whatever he was going to do, he wanted it to be like a special a position, one of that course. matched his opinion of himself and something that would exclude him from the standard military chain of command. So like Jimmy Stewart, Gene Autry, Clark Gable, these guys are all fighting as normal soldiers, more or less. John Wayne does not want to do that. Scott Iman writes, quote, it's probable that Wayne was emotionally committed to working under Ford's command, was embarrassed about Donovan shying away from him at the height of the war, and simply wasn't willing to enlist and take his chances. Certainly, he had an image of himself as an officer under Ford, but as he would say, I would have had to go in as a private. I took a dim view of that. So... The reality is unclear. And again, some people will say initially John Wayne was trying to get this gig running guns. Others will say he only just wanted to be in Ford's unit making movies like he never wanted to get close to the danger. Hard to say. Uh, the author of the BuzzFeed write up I quoted earlier adds, quote, the truth of Wayne's hesitation was logical, if unspeakable. He'd worked for a decade to claw his way out of the quickies. If he left Hollywood then, even to serve his country, he might not ever regain his momentum. So he stayed put, made a dozen films, two of which which dealt with the war and allowed the press to rationalize his lack of service. Mm. He doesn't want to fuck his career up, right? No, or his hair. Or yeah, whatever. Or his hair. And that's the dominant theory. Now, Richard Jensen has a third theory, which at least, at least explains why Wayne was not accepted for the OSS. He argues that while John Ford was giving John Wayne shit for not serving and being like, why are you being a coward? Why aren't you willing to like man up and, and take part in this war? While he's doing that, Ford is also telling Wild Bill Donovan, don't hire this guy. Don't let him in. Don't hi don't bring this guy like he'd done before. You know, um, he does this like uh, about roles in Hollywood. So friends that tracks. That's it an totally tracks. That's absolutely the guy John Ford is. Right, because he's already fallen out with him by this point. So he well, they're in and out a bunch. Like they they're close. Like Wayne will take care of him when he's sick and dying. They have a codependent kind of thing, right? Right. Like it's totally a codependent relationship because like Ford will want nothing to do with him and then want him back and kind right. of. Vice, and yeah, like, they kissed that one time, but they were drunk and they whatever. were drunk. They then were drunk they were spooning, mm -hmm. um, it but it was cold. So, you know, John Ford uh, kind of fucking around. And he does this like when he's not when he's like shit shutting down Wayne's ability to get roles early on in his career. He's also constantly being like, no, you're not talented. So nobody's going to want you to act in their movies like you're shitty at acting. You look like crap. Oh, you're fat, God. You know, he's like this the worst his person. mom voice. <laughs> yeah. And of course, John Wayne loves him forever and takes care of him when he's sick and dying. But yeah, so friends speculated like this isn't Jensen who invents the speculation. People who are close to both of them speculate that Ford stops John Wayne from getting a job as the OSS. Some will say it's revenge for what he did with Chada that he like is divorcing his wife, you know, that Ford is just angry that he's getting a divorce because he's super Catholic. Uh, Jensen notes that others speculated Ford didn't want John Wayne to get a chance to, quote, prove he was Ford's equal. So he just didn't want him to like he wanted him to kind of look like shit for not being in the war because otherwise he might look good. And then that's bad for Ford because it makes Ford less powerful in the relationship. I don't see why both can't be true. I think um, it seems like both are true. And he yeah. wanted Wayne to think he was he wanted him in the war. Yeah. Wayne, and Wayne didn't even want to go. He well, sure didn't. didn't that seems really war. clear that John Wayne did not want to go to fucking war. Um, and I, I mean, look, I don't blame him. But yes, it is. I don't I don't cling to this kind of masculinity. Yeah. So I don't have the same. But it does seem like a big old oversight for those who are waving Wayne flags at rallies still. Yeah, it, it's it's. That's exactly like 
Right. And it's going to get grosser later. Like, obviously, as a general rule, I am pro draft dodging. I will say <laughs> World War Two is the one war where you're kind of questionable if you're dodging it because like yes. some shit did need to get done, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, but generally speaking, I'm pro draft dodging, but not when you become like super pro war forever after that, then then you're being scummy. If you draft dodge and are like, nobody should have to fight in a war, that's fine. That's perfectly consistent. That is not where John Wayne's going to go. Right. And your entire persona is crafted around sort of this American hero worship. Yes. And you rely on that and you're winning these, you know, battles on the frontier. You're yeah. forming a nation. You are literally playing soldiers fighting in the Battle of Iwo Jima. You know, that's yeah. like one yeah. of your iconic films. And like you, you didn't even, wouldn't even make, didn't even find out a way to make movies for the government during the war. Like, right. Um, let alone do the shit. And by the way, Jimmy Stewart, never a big action star, no. but fucking put up when it was time to put up. Uh, put his fucking money where his mouth was. Um, anyway, you know who else puts their money where their mouth is? Products and services who support this podcast, who also helped carry out the bombing of Fortress Europe. Good on them. Mm-hmm. That's the uh, that's the one promise that our sponsors make, is that they have bombed German cities. <laughs> um Absolutely. Uh, uh, from it's the Italian fra- cities yeah. they have problems with. You know what I mean? They mm-hmm. were already. Mm-hmm. It was over. Yeah, dropping pasta on them. Um, Just way too much bombing of Napoli. Yeah, it was. It was it, a lot of pretty cities get pretty fucked up here. <laughs> yeah. Look, it's it's a messy war. Um, <laughs> so uh, ads. We're back. So. Um, so good shit. It's good stuff. Uh, John Wayne does like volunteer spends like three weeks visiting troops fighting in Guam. Like he does a little tour. He does some USO shit, oh, cute. but not, not much. Scott Iman, who is like a very positive biographer really likes John Wayne even notes that like he didn't really do much in World War II by the standards of other guys even other guys who didn't join the military he did less than them he just visited troops and like flipped his pistol around a few times and and he doesn't visit them much like Bob Hope right who sucks bad person does a lot of like horrible regressive politics but Bob Hope cannot serve in this period and like spends like his whole all of his time going to field hospitals and doing shows like there are guys who don't serve but still like put a huge amount of time into like keeping morale up for troops john wayne does a bit of that but he he doesn't really want to take a break from his career to even do that um he would visit uso hospitals to talk to wounded soldiers who would often ask him why aren't you in this war duke um and he would he would be like i have an old football injury yes Um, i I knew he was gonna yeah. say that uh, shit. I just oh I my threw God. my back out, boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh is, you know, you ever heard of body mm. surfing? Yeah, yeah like this is the ev- thing we used to do in the old west. Like, like every <laughs> single soldier who landed at Normandy hadn't fucked themselves up playing football <laughs> yeah. as a kid, right? Like they didn't have pads back then. All of them were had shoulder and back injuries. No, you are cannon um, fodder. You need to go now. Yeah, it's fine if your back hurts. It'll be over soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Um. So he, yeah, he sometimes would say that President Roosevelt had asked him to keep morale up by making more movies. This is super untrue but he does make a lot of movies um and obviously this works out great for him career-wise because all of the other leading men who might take roles for him are off fighting and in some cases dying um you know brilliantly that, uh, brilliant strategy i love have, that have you seen gone with the wind i have you know the kid the like fresh-faced young kid who like marries scarlet early in the movie and becomes uh like a, goes off to die and dies in the confederate army Yes, yes. He he actually dies fighting in World War II. Oh, damn. Like, he dies in combat, yeah. Um, so this is, again, a lot of times you have, like, soldiers, like, especially nowadays, and, and when Vietnam comes around, like, there will be moments and stuff, and, and in Korea, like with Elvis, where it's very performative. This is not performative for most of the celebrities who join in World War II. Right. Clark like, Gable did People didn't, die. Right? Yeah. Gable, uh, Gable did. Gable, wait. 
uh, shit. I, I, I'm, I'm mixing him up with the other one. Um, you said Cooper didn't. Yeah, Cooper did not. Clark Gable does. Clark Gable is like a fucking a gunner, like a, on a on a bomber plane, um, which is one of the most dangerous jobs in the whole war. Um, you're like hanging in like a, a glass cockpit on the bottom of a plane exposed to gunfire with no armor. And if you get shot, you just get the air sucked out of you and pulled to the ground. It's a horrible Rhett job. Butler did that. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, yeah. Guys. He he Fuck. fucking yeah, he he sure did. Look, he's not he's pretty right wing himself, but definitely hot. Like we could we could no, be fair about that. We're comparing tr- pieces of trap. I mean, like that's what this show is. Is like it is though. It is though funny that Rhett Butler goes to war and like survives, and the kid who dies in Gone with the Wind <laughs> also dies fighting I the know. Nazis. <laughs> yeah. um, so whoops. on the nose. A little on the nose, Hollywood. Um, so uh, if you're surprised that the man who dodged the draft in World War II, which is the only war in which that's arguably unethical, goes on uh-huh. to become a right-wing icon, you should not be. What's interesting is that John Wayne himself would spend the rest of his life outraged by his own failure to serve. Whether it was venal profit-seeking or simple cowardice, he saw it as the ultimate strike against his machismo, and Ford never lets him forget it. Oh, God. Perhaps the first expression of this comes in 1944, when he helps to create the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, or MPA. Now, with a name like that, you know some fucked up culture war bullshit is about to drop, and it sure did. Yeah. See, brown and- people will be killed in the, in these films. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's more that, like, th- these guys are hardcore anti-communist, which... If you're an anti-communist in the U.S., World War II, you kind of got to sit out a little bit. Like, you got to kind of keep quiet because the mm-hmm. Soviet Union's our ally. You can't kind of, you cannot be as unhinged in your attacks against communism for four Sh- years or so. Right. Yeah. Because um, we, we kind of need them to do you all of the dying. You got to put that on hold you until put they that on hold. win the war. Because we need like 20 million of them or so to die fighting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, So 1944, they start this anti-communist organization kind of near the end of the war. And John Wayne had not been political earlier in his career. He would later claim to have even had a socialist period. I don't know how true I think that is. It's kind of a right wing thing to claim. He used to be a socialist in college. Then you saw the light. I think he's one of the first guys to do that. Absolutely. Um, This is... Yeah, (laughs) that is such a playbook. Yeah. His friend Henry Fonda later recalled, quote, the Duke couldn't even spell politics in the 30s. So (laughs) I think it's probable he just did not give a shit. Um, But in the early 40s, again, he's got to do something to feel like a man. He's got to do something to, like, shore up his credentials as a tough guy. And being anti-communist seems like the best bet. So he gets elected head of the Screen Actors Guild in the early 40s. Um, and he claims that becoming the head of a union is the first time he starts to notice the deadly trend of on wrestling socialism. Oh, Once God. You get, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's so perfect. That's also just so mm-hmm. peak, like right wing icon idiot. Oh, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Thanks to this union, I realize unions are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, except for this one mm-hmm. and the police. Once you get union, once you get sensitized to it, he told an interviewer, you'd begin to be aware of cracks at our president, the flag, patriotism. He described the attitude of his colleagues towards traditional Americana as quote a kind of sneering. Now, Shut this the is all fuck s- up. I know, Sorry. John, you fucking <laughs> asshole. This is all shit he would claim later after he became a political figure. Um, Film critic and historian Emmanuel Levy believes that guilt over his failure to serve in World War II drove Wayne to right-wing politics. There's ample evidence to suggest this. Friends of his, like Mary St. John, often gave telling anecdotes. Quote, He was not the kind of man to dwell on it or talk about it, but you knew he did. You could see it in his face whenever anyone asked him about his war record. He wouldn't tell them that he had not served, and it made him feel like a hypocrite. So... He That's claimed. so perfect. Mm-hmm. Of course, you're going to make up for your your feeling that you didn't defend your country by you utilizing the most bullshit prop of oh, so-called Americanism, which is defending yourself against communism. Yeah. And and it, oh, it's so it, it's so perfect. And it is like the parallels again to today to Trump's little bone spurs. I hate to bring his name up again, but just it's so clear. And the people who are the most vitriolic are also folks who would never in their fucking lives fight for any cause. 
Yeah. It's the same shit with like George Bush, you know, getting getting a cushy family excuse not to actually fight in Vietnam. Right. Um, you know, it, it, it's 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 this. But like uh, super I, willing to send other people to fight. And well, then, what matters is the image. It doesn't matter. Like what you do doesn't matter. It's just like why you can you can pay for your daughter to have an abortion and also support ending the right. Uh, to 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 reproductive choice, mm-hmm. um, because it's not what you do that matters. It's what you say, you know, yep. in public, and it's whether or not you have the wear the right hat. It's like Ben Shapiro with his cowboy hat and his big black truck. That's exactly what um, it is. You've Th- never that's... towed Ben Shapiro. You don't know how to tow. You don't know how to set a fucking tow hitch. Like by God, you would panic if you had to change lanes with a trailer. Like, but you're gonna I, you're gonna I, have I, a truck. I would dispute obviously, that characterization. Yeah, um, Ben, haul like a fucking ten foot little bit little baby trailer just just once, Ben. <laughs> Show me you know how to use a John truck Wayne for literally even anything. Do tiny boat work. What was it? Small boat. Work? Small boat work. Motherfucker yeah. couldn't do small fishing boat for work. marlin. God damn it! Go run some guns, John Wayne. So. <clears throat> Levy, Eugene Emmanuel Levy, the, okay. the fucking film criticism, claims that like this sort of shame is what drives Wayne to the MPA in 1944. Like his blockbuster war movies, doing this was a prominent and easily publicized way to frame himself as a warrior struggling against a great evil when he had actually failed to do anything about the real great evil of the time. Um, he served as the president of the organization starting in 1949. Now, the year before, at age 41, John Wayne was cast in a film called Red River. This would be the first movie to feature Wayne as he is now most famous to millions of Americans as a gruff, hard-edged, late middle-aged cowboy. Because again, mm-hmm. he's aged, like he looks like he's in his 50s in this. Cause, but also kind of the right? perfect like American hero, um, yes. sort of unwitting, like I don't want to be here yeah. Um, like protagonist, which yeah. is something that we love. We love a guy yeah. who's like about to retire, but he gets drawn out of retirement because he's got to fucking kick ass. Yeah. It's like you're fucking John McClane. He's balding and divorced and he's like exhausted, but then he's got to go murder some Germans, you know? Right. And we love that shit. Bruce Willis did this perfectly. Yeah, he really did. He did everything right in his <laughs> in his career. Also terrible um, politics. Probably. I've never wanted to know what Bruce Willis believes about <laughs> politics. It seems like that wouldn't make me happy. <laughs> it's also changed in the last like 10 years, I feel like. Whereas like right wingers, we would think we're more right wing in Hollywood like 10 years ago or just like, hey, that guy's pretty good. You know, he's fine. Yeah, it's 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 the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing where it's yeah. like you've suddenly gone from being like an arch conservative to one of the least crazy people talking about politics in America <laughs> mm-hmm. because everything has lurched so far to the right. It's, it's great. It's fine. It's not going to cause any problems. Um, so it's this John Wayne, this kind of tough, older cowboy, um, this old hand who he's like one of the terms you see is a begrudging tutor for younger cowboys, right? That's uh, a big part of his appeal in these movies is he's taking some fresh faced young book under his wing. This is the John Wayne. He's a star at this point. This is the John Wayne that becomes an icon, right? Like this is the John Wayne whose face is still plastered all over fucking merch tables at gun shows to this day. So his his career torpedoes forward at the same time as his anti-communist activism lurches forward. He serves three turns as president of the uh, the 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 MPA until 1952. Now, since this was the height of the second Red Scare, many of John Wayne's friends and many of the studio executives in particular warn him that like, hey, you might not want to get into politics this much. It, it could kill you at the box office. Americans, whatever we feel about communists, may not want to see John Wayne cowboy hero wearing a suit talking to Congress about like your your colleagues being socialists. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, John Wayne claim like and it's one of those things the, the idea that like this is probably not true. The idea that like he got a lot of pushback saying he shouldn't get into right wing politics is probably a lie because John Wayne is the only one who claims it. And he only ever brings this up to point out that. But even then, I became the biggest box office draw in Hollywood after, you know, I started doing all this stuff. So like that's right. how he frames it as like they didn't want me to start being anti-communist. But once I did, that just made me more popular. Uh-huh. Um yeah. That's once again trying to cancel me. Yeah. First exactly. they took Jenny, 
And then they take my <laughs> anti-communist activism. He is, by the way, married to Chada and has divorced uh, Jenny at this point. Whether or not, like, his kids no. today will claim, I should note, that he was a good dad and, like, stayed in their lives. Uh, I don't know what the case is. Some biographers have claimed other things, but his kids are pretty positive yeah, about him. At gunpoint, so, they said that. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I'm not going <laughs> to tell them what their lives were like. Um, he certainly, like, I don't think they, they wanted for anything, right? Like, he didn't, like, like they benefited from the Wayne money, it seems like. So, true, whatever. True, true, true. Um, so Eugene Levy describes how he generally framed this uh, to the press. Wayne said that those who warned him must have meant it would ruin me with the Moscow fan clubs because when I became president of the Alliance, I was 32nd on the box office polls. But last year, I'd skidded up near the top. So this is very familiar right wing framing, right? They tried to cancel me, but I just it just made me more popular. All that shit. He's the perfect figurehead for not world war two arguably the most righteous american war but the uh, cold war the most he is like, absolutely exactly yes. <laughs> like unrighteous like pillaging you know third world countries or global south countries uh yeah. under phantom threats i'm not saying it didn't get real at, cer- at a certain point but like it was such a propaganda war he is we have this one war that is unquestionably necessary. And he's yeah. like, nah, that ain't me. <laughs> no, but no. then we start invading these tiny little countries. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Fuck them up. Sign me up. Fuck them up. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's cool. He he invents being James Woods in a way. So <laughs> the part of the second Red Scare that John Wayne was personally involved in was the backlash to the pro-Soviet movies that he made in the early 1940s. Members of the House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, uh, were livid that studios like MGM had made films celebrating the Russian war effort. Suddenly, Hollywood stars were being called up to inform on their fellow celebs for left-wing sympathies. Levy writes, quote, It got to the point where Leela Rogers, Ginger's mother and vice president at RKO, was asked to examine all screenplays for questionable content. She was proud to declare that she had found a line in The Tinder Comrade, which stated, share and share alike. That's the meaning of democracy. Dalton Trumbo, who wrote the screenplay, later became one of the Hollywood Ten. The friendly witnesses of HUAC included many Hollywood celebrities, such as Gary Cooper, who reportedly condemned communism because it was not on the level, whatever that meant. Or Adolf Minju, whose credo was that communism could be expressed by players by a look, by an inflection, by a change in voice. So... What? That's what literally like Trumbo gets canceled for shit like that, for saying like democracy is about sharing. Like that's like the most cancel culture America's ever gotten. Yes. Is what Huack Huack. does to fucking. Yeah, exactly. On American activities, man, they want to bring that shit back, by the way. Oh, for sure. They're so horny to do this. Ronald (laughs) Reagan was one of the guys who named the most names. He loved getting up in front of Congress and informing on his colleagues. Now. (laughs) To her, to their credit, there were some very base fucking actors and actresses, including um, Catherine Hepburn, mm-hmm. refuses to talk to the community. She's like, yeah. "What the fuck? Like, you can't make me do shit. I don't give a fuck. Hell like, yeah. I'm Catherine Hepburn. What are you gonna do? Cancel Catherine Hepburn? No, you're fucking not. Yeah. Um, and they don't. Uh, John Wayne, who is an avowed anti-communist, does nothing. So he does not get up in front of Huac. This is not a principled stance. His biographer, Iman, claims that this was in part that because like, well, he wasn't really that judgmental about people. He wouldn't have wanted to cancel his colleagues because if he liked you, he didn't care about your politics. You know, he's buddies with Orson Welles, who's pretty left wing. Um, that's one justification for why he doesn't get up in front of Huac. Um, blacklisted screenwriter Howard Koch, who's one of the people who gets caught up in this, theorizes that it was not John Wayne's decision to stay out, uh, but instead studio meddling that kept him from testifying. Hmm. In some cases, the heads of the studios made deals with the committee not to put a certain individual on the stand publicly. That was true not only of so-called suspects, what they like to call the unfriendly witnesses, but also of friendly witnesses that the studio didn't want to have tainted by political publicity of any kind. Somebody like Wayne is a good example. How are you going to get people rushing in to see him shooting down the Apaches when they start thinking of him as the guy wearing a suit and tie and saying, what a great job all these 70-year-old politicians with their glasses and bow ties are doing defending America? Mixed message. So. I mean, money is number one in his life at this point. And. Yeah. You know, obviously cowardice not going into World War II, but also potentially just wanting to keep making money. 
It is also, here's the thing, and this is going to sound weird, but it's kind of also a condemnation of him that he doesn't testify in front of Huack because it shows he doesn't really believe. Doesn't believe in shit. Cary Grant, who again goes and fights in World War II, also a right wing shithead. Cary Grant's studio goes, don't get up and testify in front of Huack. It's going to be bad for your image. But Cary Grant, again, this is not a good thing to do, but he does believe it because he gets up and says, fuck you to the studio and testifies against his colleagues and stuff. Right. Which is, and, and again, <laughs> we're getting into like murky moral territory, but I guess I'm saying. It's more respectable to be a right wing shithead who believes enough to hurt your career by it than it is to only be a right wing shithead when you think it's good for your career. I guess that's where I'm landing here. I, I feel you landing there. I, I land more in the like, I'm glad he didn't snitch. And yeah, uh, sure. So you needed, yes. You needed to do communism to fucking booster your career and yeah. go speak at some I, brunches. I, but like, I guess, good for you. Good and bad aren't as as meaningful here as just the state that like Cary Grant was a guy who believed in some things. Right. John Wayne didn't. No. Right. That that's more because like obviously yes it's good to not testify. It just is a note of like how kind of empty he is. Mm-hmm. He's still like, punching women, guys. Don't don't oh, worry. For, and I don't know Cary Grant probably too. Right. Yeah. I don't know much about Everyone's the guy. Everyone's still punching women. Maybe not Jimmy Stewart. I don't. I want to believe he wouldn't, but I don't know much about Jimmy Stewart. Um, he did That's for a different was, show did was part of the bombing of Korea so I don't know some some mixed stuff there <laughs> <Yeah>. too <laughs> um, so yeah it's weird uh, as Scott Iman writes being seen as anti-communist had real benefits for John Wayne in the blacklist years that followed quote and so the blacklist era began there would be more hearings in 1950 the result was that dozens were jailed hundreds lost their jobs hundreds more left the country some died every motion picture union from the screen actors guild to the screen directors guild ultimately capitulated to the blacklist all this would be called by one writer echoing daniel defoe the plague years dalton trumbo had another name for it the time of the toad during this period the right-wing press regularly ganged up on performers who had committed the terrible sin of not serving in the military during world war ii the hearst columnist westbrook pegler accused danny k of not giving exactly his all during the war and then added the seasoning of anti-semitism by mentioning k's real name kaminsky pegler me- neglected to mention that many conservatives hadn't served john wayne among them by the way don't come for my boy danny k don't you fucking come for my boy danny k leave like, danny k alone fuck you also- pegler what the why are you pulling I love oh god pulling out the anti-semitism oh for sure peace for not going and fighting in world war ii to, like what are you what are you talking about here yeah it's it's awesome uh so again and this is part of the point that people will make is that by being super pro anti-communist very right wing he d- deflects a lot of criticism for the fact that he doesn't do anything in the war right yep um, well, he gets the pass good. because he's someone needs their Christian masculine identity. I mean, that's like he's more of an emblem. He's a symbol. Yeah. Yeah. He's like Batman, but yes. worse. Uh, yeah. A lot worse than Batman. If Batman sees the bat signal, it's like, oh, mm. uh, I got to got to <laughs> seize the bat signal as he's like cuddling with the teenager he trafficked into the United <laughs> States. And it's like, can someone else deal with that? <laughs> Shut it off. Um, So with his colleagues blacklisted, John Wayne stars in an increasing series of right wing films, including 1952's Big Jim McClane, in which he played a heroic Huac investigator. In 1954, he was cast in what would probably become the most shameful role of his career. Francesca, are you ready for this? (sighs) This is my favorite John Wayne role. Genghis Khan. Hell yeah. (laughs) Just another white guy taking an Asian actor's role. It's amazing. Somebody's like, who are we going to get to pay? Genghis Khan. You know who looks like a Mongolian warlord? (laughs) John Wayne. John Wayne is middle aged, now kind of fat. John Wayne. It's inc- he looks so silly in this. It's it, amazing. It's, al- it's almost beyond parody. How like racist this movie is. It's uh, uh, like if you were joking about racism in this period, you would like make up John Wayne being Genghis Khan as like a <laughs> gag. But no, yes. they really did it. 
Hell yeah, they did. Look at that yeah, mustache. Look at that mustache. With those it's blue uh, eyes. Unbelievable. Every, everyone needs to look this up right now. And yeah. I think we need to watch this high. Yeah. It's incredible that like, uh, obviously the, the most famous white guy who racistly plays an Asian in this period is Mickey Rooney. But boy, <laughs> yes. boy, howdy is John Wayne nipping at his fucking heels in terms of racist casting here. <laughs> But also, like, <gasps> Genghis is the good guy? What would it... Because, like, John Wayne's it's, generally the hero. Yeah, it's more just that, like, he's impressive, right? I think that's probably... Sure. Like, I have I watched this years ago as a kid just because I heard about it. Like, I think it's more of just, like, a <laughs> historical epic. You're not trying to, like... I don't know. Um, also, here's another fun fact. The, more w- the role was originally written for Marlon Brando. Oh, see... <laughs> You would rather see Brando as Genghis Khan? Can you imagine Brando as Genghis Khan. This is so funny to me. The, it's really funny. I mean, maybe um, old Brando, like really old Brando, yeah, I could see. Yeah, fat Brando as Genghis Khan. Yo, fat Brando not having to walk anywhere, just being like hauled places. <laughs> just or sitting like, on a horse. Or just sitting on a horse. <laughs> just Kill going around him. the whole time, not moving. <laughs> Kill them. Like, I get that. <laughs> Just stroking a long, sort of wispy oh, white man. beard. Uh, that again, might have made sense. Oh, watch this the is documentary so about the making of the Isle of Dr. Moreau, which is also an incredible Marlon Brando documentary. Among other things, he decides that his character is secretly a dolphin and wears a bucket on his head the whole movie, but never explains it to anyone. It fucking rules. <laughs> Marlon fuck? Brando's like late career Brando is the greatest Hollywood actor there has ever been. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It just mm-hmm. like... When everyone wants your career to stay alive, mm-hmm. except for you. Yeah, it's very funny. Nobody hated Hollywood more than Marlon Brando, a man <laughs> who only ever made his money as an actor. It's also he's going to be the hero of well, one of the heroes of our third episode. So okay, okay, good good times. Anyway, the Conqueror, John Wayne as Genghis Khan, not a good movie, as this excerpt from the Guardian's film blog makes clear. The film opens with Temujin, as Genghis was originally known, intercepting a wedding procession of Merkits. No, not meerkats. The Merkit lord has a Tartar bride, Bortai, Jane Hayward, but not for long. I feel this Tartar woman is for me, intones Temujin. My blood says, take her. Few actors could make lines like this sound good, and John Wayne wasn't one of them. Writer Oscar Millard wanted to give the screenplay an archaic flourish. Mindful of the fact that my story was nothing more than a tarted up western, I thought this would give it a certain cast and I left no lily unpainted, he said in 1981. It was a mistake I have never repeated. Poor old John Wayne has to prance about saying things things such as, I greet you, my mother, where normal people would say, hello, mum. This might be why he looks so miserable in every scene. You got to do something about these lines, he told Miller during filming. I can't read them. It was too late. So one of the worst movies of all time. Very cringe. But Francesca, here's the good part. Do you believe in karma? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. This is a, this is a very karma moment because while they're filming this mo- movie, they're they're in like Nevada in the desert, <laughs> like making this thing because I guess that's the, our best equivalent to Mongolia. Sure. Um, while they're making this, they are a hundred no. miles away from an atomic bomb testing site. Uh, so they they go to the government. They're like, "Hey, we got John Wayne out here filming a movie. Is it safe to be this close to nuclear bombs going off?" And the government's like, "Oh, absolutely. No, you guys are fine. It's totally far away. Not gonna be a problem. <laughs> Not gonna be a problem." So. It was a problem. Uh, The entire cast and crew of the Conqueror get massive doses of radiation. Like, like they, like like they're right next to nuclear bombs going off for days. You know, weeks as they film this. We can horrible place, guys. Don't worry. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, It's gonna be good for the lighting. Yes. yes, Your burns look incredible, honey. That's great. So like, what was the union doing at this point? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he, th- it's been too gutted. Uh, they, they can't <laughs> complain about getting nuked or they'll get called out as being socialist. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's very funny that John Wayne gets nuked by the U.S. government, and spoilers, it's what kills him. That's extremely funny. It's the funniest thing that could possibly have happened. Holy he gets shit. he gets fucking nuked and irradiated while pretending to be Genghis Khan. That rules. That's incredibly funny. <laughs> that is kind of like the spirit of Genghis Khan. It is. Genghis Khan was smiling down from heaven like, yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is what I want. That is amazing. Um, wow. And so, so, okay, how much radiation are we talking? A fuckload, Francesca. <laughs> Wait. So, again, recently it's become a story that, like, a bunch of Russian soldiers probably got radiation sick because they dug trenches in Chernobyl, yes. right? Chernobyl, a lot of radiation, also a lot less than there was decades ago when it was new. These guys are standing downwind of nuclear bombs as they go off. <laughs> a lot of radiation. Oh my God. Um, the the cast and crew of the Conqueror, as well as a, a startling number of Americans like them, because the U.S. government nukes a lot of American citizens. They get known as downwinders in the decades to come because they all get cancer. Um, by 1981, this is filmed in 54, by 1981, 96 of the 220 cast and crew on the set had developed cancer. Oh, 46 shit. of them, including John Wayne, had died um it's pretty cool within he, what time period again uh 30 years a little less than 30 years uh. half of them have cancer and a quarter of them are dead from cancer um including john wayne he gets a couple of cancers right first in 1964 so 10 years later it's lung cancer so maybe it was a smoking i'm sure the nukes didn't help he mm-hmm. finally dies of like a horrible stomach cancer so he probably dies in part, at least, as a result of getting nuked on the set of The Conqueror. Of all the sets, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Wasn't going to be a good one. It had to be the Genghis Khan no. Conqueror. It is extremely funny, though. It um, is very funny. At least, see, the one redeeming thing, I think, about this is I don't... It doesn't sound like he did, like, a pigeon, like, accent, like some sort of... I don't know. T- I mean... Stereotypical... I think he does a Asian- John Wayne... So, yeah. yeah, I guess that's better. I don't know that I want to like, I, do, I don't certainly want to be saying what's better or worse. It all seems pretty rough to me. <laughs> no, I think we all agree. Everyone on that set deserved to get nuked. I mean, that yeah, was it's it. It's fine that this happened. <laughs> it's co- totally fine. Um, good stuff. Um, and that's going <laughs> to that's gonna be our part two, Francesca. We're going to have you back for part three. But for right I now. I can't wait. You want to plug your pluggables? Give us oh my a, God, you guys, check out the Habituation Room podcast. Uh, I promise. Uh, well, I don't know. I Maybe we'll just watch Genghis Khan on mm-hmm. our next episode. We might, baby. Who knows? I'm excited for the third chapter and all so the meat they find in his stomach. Oh, yeah. All the meat in his guts. All right. Well, that's going to do us uh, and everyone else, you know, until until next time. Uh, stand directly next to a nuclear blast while the government says it's fine because you're John Wayne. You know the government's never going to lie to you. Oh my God. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.